My name is William J. Eckert. I was born in Hamburg, Germany, nine, May 19, 1919. He came to the United States April 20th or thereabouts, 1928. I was nine years old at the time. My father died when I was 13. I quit school. I went to sea for a short stint as a ship's boy. And then as soon as my mother became an American citizen, I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. August the 8th, 1939. I was transferred to Paris Island. I got out of boot camp, and my first two years out of boot camp, I was an assistant engineer on the Navy tugboat, the YT-132. After two years on Paris Island, I felt I had enough time because I joined the Marine Corps with the desire to go to China. After two years on Paris Island, I requested a transfer. First choice, China. Second choice, might as well go home. I'm not traveling anywhere. New York Navy Yard. Well, by the grace of God, I got New York Navy Yard because had I gotten China, I might, I might well have been involved in the Bataan Death March. Because the people that were in China at the time were all caught up in that. <laughs> On the way up to Guam, up to Gu Guam from Guadalcanal, we were hit by a Japanese uh, torpedo wing, and they dropped the tin, the tin fish, as we call them, and it was heading right for us. But an LCI gunboat took it, intercepted it, and, and killed about 12 men on on the LST, on the LCI. So they saved our lives, though. On our trip, we had equipment and about three, four hundred men, and they sacrificed 12 men to save us. The gunner scored hits on some of the Japanese suicide planes. Fifteen of the kamikazes were knocked down. And next morning, we got a report that there were three, three unidentified planes coming our way. They were called bogies. And then they came close enough to where we had visual identification, we could identify it. And the order came, hold your fire. Everybody was pretty nervous, so having one man open fire, and, and when that one man opened fire, it was just a wildfire. The whole convoy opened fire on it, and we knocked them down. And there were three others that went down too that was reported later on. But I actually, this one I saw as it hit the water. Fortunately, not all the kamikaze missions were successful. Well, it took us... We came from, from Guadalcanal to go to Guam. And we were floating reserve for Saipan. And after, while we were up at floating reserve there, it was the battle forming the Philippine Sea, very serious naval battle. Could have been either win or lose for America. So they chased us back to the Marshall Islands and the Weetok on the same LST, which was LST-447. And they had a skipper on that. It was, we all looked at like Captain Bly of the Matt Bounty. Then we, 
when it was time that we could go up to Guam. By that time, by the time we got to Guam, I had 60, 64 days as a passenger on this ship. While we were then on Guam, going into Guam, I was the sixth wave. I was with C Company, 3rd Amphibious Tractor Battalion. We made two or three landings. I mean, one night I was called upon to deliver ammunition to a beachhead. And that night, my platoon sergeant didn't want to assign anyone to it, so he made us draw straws. And I was always lucky, so I got the lucky straw. I had to go. And it was pitch black. And we went to the beach where he said we should go. And while we were waiting there, the, the Japanese opened up a mortar barrage on us. And my buddy said, here they come. I said, here I go. And with that, I jumped off the tractor and I landed in water about a foot deep. And there was a machine gun position there that had been set up by, the, by another motor battalion. And I said, hey, fellas, you mind if I come in? Because I had, I forgot the password. They asked me the password, I was dead. <laughs> so anyway, I said, can I come in? And no problem, I was there. And then the, then the shells started to fly. the U.S. High Command decided that Iwo Jima must be seized, and preparations were made for the assault against that island fortress. After Guam, instead of being a member of a tractor group, I became ordnance for the company. So we got up to Guam, and I stayed on LST-70, which was a Coast Guard LST. During wartime, the Coast Guard becomes part of the Navy. So for three days, I stayed on the LST while my battalion went in, it was landing as landing aircraft and taking troops in, taking wounded out. And logistics was also our job. And the third day, the third division went in. The first day, the 4th and 5th Division went in. We took in the 28th Marines of the 5th Division, and they're the outfit that put the flag on top of Mount Surabaj. While I was on the beach, or maybe not the second day or so, I was happened to be watching Mount Surabaj, and I saw people going up on the side of the mountain, and they were carrying something that I thought was a Bangalore torpedo, which was an explosive charge that they would use to blow out a cave. Uh, some strange things I did see happen there. When the flamethrowers would blow the, the flames into a cave, they blew it in on one side and it came out on the other side, the flame. This I, I actually saw happen. And then when the, regarding back to the uh, Bangalore torpedo thing going up the mountain. As I kept watching it, I suddenly saw the flag go up. It's men, it's, that's six men or so, and here all of a sudden the flag up. And it was joy to behold, because there was a roar that went all over the island. When I was about 10 years old, my my father bought me a 25 cent harmonica. And slowly but surely, I started picking out the notes and had a pretty good ear for music. And I started learning to play different songs, easy songs to start with. And as I went along in life, I always had a harmonica in my pocket. And when I got in a group, I would play the harmonica, people would sing, and I know, I know quite a few songs. If I knew the song, I could play it. 
I had a lot of German music, Irish music, Italian music. You, you name the song and I can pretty much put it together for you on a harmonica. Yeah. Yeah. The other stuff, you got enough?